The sky tonight is blacker than I've ever seen it before. It swirls with slow malevolence, growling and mourning. My scarf is pulled up to my eyes, but my cheeks and nose are still burning pink with the bitter cold regardless. I'm in line with the others, waiting to board the ship that'll take me from the rig. The winds tonight are too powerful for helicopter travel, so ship it is. It's a military vessel, Royal Navy. The gray-white waves crash against its hull. Spray carries up to the Union Jack ensign stamped on the side. I'm not sure if the ship's military nature makes me feel more or less afraid. But I don't have a choice. Seven workers are always selected to board. Always. And tonight, I'm one of those seven. My name is Reg. I spent alternating months working on an oil rig in the North Sea. The work is not as bad as you might expect, and the pay grade is actually rather good. The boredom is the worst part. The isolation. Interspersed with moments of intense stress and lightning-like panic. We get Wi-Fi on the good days, but it's spotty at best. If you like your YouTube with 144p with 20 minutes of buffering time, then the rig is the right place for you. There's about 200 of us here at any given time, and honestly, sometimes it's kind of nice. During the day, in rare hours of warmth, the sun sparkles off the pipes and railings in the white and bright yellow. The mood is cheerful. Everyone has their purpose. Everyone has their role. Then the other times. The other times. You'll find yourself stood on the bridge in the grim hours before dawn. Frozen in place as you desperately try to fix the shitty job the engineer before you did on the generator that powers the crane. Made all the more difficult with the torn and battered gloves that limited the motions of your already shaking fingers. protective goggles quickly steam to the point of uselessness, so you take them off, only for the icy rain to lash out all at once into your eyes. What can I say? There's good days and bad days, can't complain. My shifts on the rig are typical. As I mentioned, one month on, one month off. We get helicopters back as a squad of about 20 or 25. We go our separate ways once back on the mainland. And then I'll see some of them again next month when we return to work. Occasionally some of them will get moved to other rigs. Pretty straightforward. But there's an anomaly. One that I've always wondered about. I've asked around, but no one is able, or perhaps willing, to give me a straight answer. Five days before the end of my shift on the rig, seven of my colleagues are selected, randomly, or otherwise, I don't know. They're chosen late in the afternoon, told to gather their belongings, and then by night, they're gone. Move to another rig is all I'm ever told on the matter, when I can actually find someone to give an answer at all. This happens without fail. Five days before the end of my shift, every shift, and it's done it since I first began the work early in the year. The people that are selected, I never see again. 
most times, if I even know them by name at all, they're only acquaintances. But sometimes I've known them personally. I had the details of a man who was chosen four months ago, and a good friend of mine, a guy named Figs, was called for the previous assignment, but they've both stopped answering their calls. Most of us use crappy phones offered by the company during our shifts on the rig, so it's possible the devices were just ditched in favor of better models upon the return to the land. But still, I can't shake the unease. And I'm not sure why I seem to be the only one who's concerned. Not that it matters now, anyway. Today marks five days before the end of my shift. And for the first time, I find myself as one of the workers selected. Normally, when I'm able to catch their departure for myself, they leave by helicopter. But tonight the sky is too fierce. So the aforementioned military ship has pulled itself up alongside the rig. Why exactly our departure has to be on this particular night? Why your journey is important enough to warn a Royal Naval battleship to personally escort us to a new location? I do not know. I asked some of the other six, my fellow chosen colleagues, but they know just as little. One by one, we are ushered down the line, out of the biting rain from the edge of the platform and into the body of the ship as a storm hammers down overhead. We are led through cold and narrow metal corridors and into a meeting room of sorts, where we awkwardly take the offered seats. The ship groans and churns. The engine rumbles steady from down below. And two men make their way between us to the front of the room. One walks slouched. His beard and hair are scruffy, mid-fifties perhaps. I recognize him. He makes appearances on the rig from time to time, but he's not a regular lodger. Nor do I know his name. He placed forms on the desk before us as he meandered from person to person. The other man's pace is measured and deliberate, straight-backed. He turns at the head of the room and takes us all in a cool silence. He wears an immaculate white shirt beneath a blue-gray jersey and a naval cap, also in white. It's ringed at the base and visor in sleek black and shining gold and his shoulders are bedecked with the pollets in the same colors. Once the scruffier man is handed out with the last form, he stands in the opposite corner, chewing his tongue as he looks over us. The man in white stepped forward. Gentlemen, my name is Captain John Irons, and I am command of this destroyer. Destroyer? What the hell? Why would a tiny team of oil riggers need to be transported on a bloody destroyer? I'll get right to it. The forms before you now, if you signed, will bind you to the Official Secrets Act. Your involvement in this operation will be entirely secret. You will be forbidden to discuss the operational logistics, machinery, or any self-assumed purpose of the assigned rig, even to members of your own immediate family. 
For all intents and purposes, any military involvement in your assignment will be purely extraneous. Operating on an ad hoc basis in the event of threat to life weather events. The captain clenches his jaw and scans the room from left to right. You have all been selected for this temporary position based on a combination of factors, including your specialist knowledge, your time served, and the results of your personality and psychological assessments. You are welcome to refuse this assignment. If you choose to do so, you will be escorted off the ship and back onto the rig, where you will see your allocated time. If you accept the offer, and you must come to a decision in the next few minutes, it is recommended that you spend your journey time reading through your contracts. If, upon docking at the assigned rig, you decide that you no longer wish to sign the document before you, then you will be given a room and confined to your quarters for the duration of your service, and may remain confined for a period of up to an additional two weeks, depending on the schedule of the ship in question. Is that understood? His question was followed by a strained silence, one which eventually breaks into a series of low mumblings and bewildered nods from the people around me. Should you choose to accept, your pay rate for the following five days will be increased tenfold, and will, in practice, be worth the equivalent of two and a half months of solid service. My colleagues exchanged a series of glances and raised eyebrows. The energy in the room changes somewhat. You will be expected to perform your role to the best of your abilities, of course. The captain continues. And as discretion is of the utmost importance, to ask as few questions as will allow you to see out your duties. His sharp gray eyes stopped on mine just for a moment, before flicking over to meet those of the fellow in the corner, the scruffy man who occasionally visits the rig. My rig. A chill passes through me, but I say nothing. I will now ask if anyone would like to refuse the offered assignment and return to the rig. Now is your one and only chance to do so. Nobody moves. Nobody speaks. I thought about it. I really did, I swear. This whole thing has me set very much on edge. And this assignment, this offered assignment, this man, this military guy. Who the hell is he to issue us job terms and warnings and ultimatums? A part of me wants to just scrunch the document into a ball and throw it in his face and march proudly back out into my rig where I belong. But this... This opportunity to venture out into the unknown... This is some real exciting shit. I don't even care about the money that much, to be honest. I've been given a chance to see behind the curtain. To find out what happens to the seven who leave the rig. To find out what's so important about our destination. Mysteries have been presented to us. Mysteries that demand solving. I have to know. I just have to know. So I stay seated and listen to the dulled roar of the wind through the walls. Perhaps that's how they convince the Seven to stay every time. Maybe the money is just so we can rationalize our decisions. A tense moment passes when the captain looks over our shoulders and nods to someone at the back of the room. 
I turn in my seat to see an officer raise a radio to his mouth as he steps through the door, speaking into it as he walks away down the corridor. And a minute later, the rumble of the engine below groans like rolling thunder. And the ship, I can only presume, as there are no windows in the room, groans into slow life. The captain nods to us, then to the man in the corner, and takes his leave, strolling away at once. And so we begin our voyage to the assigned rig, plowing onwards through the storm. I read through the Secrets Act before me as we made our journey over the waves. There's some seriously cool concepts in here. Makes me feel a bit like a spy. Though, there's some terrifying stuff too. The time drags on. I wonder exactly where it is we're going. Left with nothing but the sounds of the engine. The flicker of turning paper and the occasional grunt or cough from my colleagues. My mind begins to wander. They swirl with curious, dark, clouded thoughts. Dread creeps up on me. It ebbs and flows, coming and receding like the tide. And I start to wonder if I've made a huge mistake. We were forced to decide so quickly. I tug at my collar. My stomach turns. I look up, and I meet the eyes of the man still stood in the corner. I clear my throat and sit up in my seat. Excuse me, mate. Don't I recognize you? I see you on the rig sometimes. The man is silent for a moment then scratches his beard. Hi. Work takes me from rig to rig. You have a good location. Less stormy than most. And what about the ones we're going to? Will it be stormy there? I asked. The man sighs. Now with frustration. Perhaps just with tiredness yeah yeah it'll be storming all right the others seem a little emboldened now the seal is broken and the questions start coming which rig is it will any of us have been stationed there before no the man replies no you won't have been this one ain't charted. Officially, it didn't even exist. Is it military owned then? Like a secret Navy supply of oil? Is that why we've been taken by battleship? The scruffy man's eyes dart to the door at the back of the room, and he rubs his nose. Uh, it ain't an oil rig as such. The machinery and the systems will be similar to what you're used to, however. As the captain said, for all intents and purposes, any military involvement in this assignment is officially ad hoc. In an event of emergency. Less said the better, etc., etc. But if it isn't oil, I ask... My blood, for reasons unknown, pumping fierce. Then what is it? What's its purpose? And why is it secret? Silence falls. And the man, in a low voice, replies. Honestly, lads. 
You don't need to concern yourself with the rig's true purpose. Nor do I recommend you try to understand. Please. I don't even know myself. I swear it. And it's better this way. I appreciate that this is a frustrating answer, but I must emphasize that it is in all our best interests for you to just do your work, take your money, and get the fuck home. Do you understand me? And out quietly, and the crew alongside mumble their acknowledgments. The gears in my mind begin to turn and grind bitterly as the curious ship sails into the night. It is well into the earliest hours of the dark morning by the time we arrive. The sky is still black and angry as we depart the destroyer. I slip and stumble against the rail as the ship rocks over the surface of the swirling sea. We all sign the Secrets Act, of course. How could we not? The captain alights the ship alongside us, and as we hurtle awkwardly on the rain-soaked platform of the rig, he goes to exchange some words, unheard, with a man in a uniform I did not recognize. Obscured, mostly, anyway, by an enormous blue jacket. I squint my eyes through the downpour and take in my surroundings. The rig is colossal. Bigger than the one we departed, and hectic. Even at this time of the night, the place is alive with people, in heavy overalls, in military uniforms. Soldiers can be seen patrolling at every level of the giant metal derrick, rushing to and fro. A group passes right by us. Most have the British flag emblazoned on their arms. But a couple towards the back have Norwegian insignia instead. Lamps and searchlights illuminate the rain in thick, heavy streaks as they scan the bridges and platforms distorted shadows thrown across their surface by the rails and pipework. But inside the derrick, protected by the great iron skeleton, there is no pipeline for any oil. There's no hose that I can see, no drill line at all. I raise a hand to my eyes and shield them from the rain. I take a step away from the group and stare, even as a powerful beam of light washes over my face. Inside the crisscrossed metal tower is an enormous, monstrous chain. The largest that I've ever seen. Each link must be the size of a car at the least. It is colossal and terrifying, in a way I do not quite understand. And standing here on the platform only a few meters away, I find myself feeling very small. Very small indeed. The chain disappears behind the beams of the tower that supports it, and below the surface of the platform, it extends, presumably, deep down under the sea. For what purpose, I do not know. I'm suddenly slammed into from behind. I stumble in shock and turn to see who pushed me. And a roaming light shows me a man with a hard hat in his outstretched hand. His eyes bloodshot red and shadowed with dark circles. He's a mess. And when he looks at me, it feels like he's staring right through me. Are you on the takeover crew then? He croaks out in a voice, hoarse beyond exhaustion. I Shane looks with the men around me. Yeah. 
I reply uneasily. Yeah, I think we might be. A siren suddenly sounds off the far side of the derrick, a loud and obnoxious wail, and we jump and start an alarm. Well, us new arrivals do. The embattled man before me does not even flinch. He just closes his eyes and starts shaking his head. No, he mutters, then louder. No, 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 fuck! No more. He slams the hard hat into my stomach and marches past. The soldiers have begun bellowing orders, but I can't hear them above the wind and the blare of the siren. The platforms and the pipes light up alternatingly in orange and blue. Fear ripples through me as the platform beneath me starts to shake. Captain Irons from the ship is suddenly in front of us, barking orders. He's hastily reading off the list of names, telling my colleagues where to go, and in a chaotic scramble, they do as they're told. This does not seem like the time or place for questioning of roles. The ground shakes. I hear the waves crash against the legs of the rig, and for that to even be possible, for me to hear them above the bellows and the roaring gale of the shrieks of the siren. They must be colossal, indeed. I can see some of the sea out of the corner of my eye. And it's a picture of wild, dark and churning fury. But my gaze is focused on something else. Blood pounds in my ears to join the cacophony. I am vaguely aware of the captain shouting my name, but I fail to copy his orders. He stepped forward now, shaking my shoulder vigorously. But I cannot move. I am frozen in place in blind terror. And don't even know why. There's something about this rig that isn't right. Isn't right at all. And I can't tear my eyes from the great chain. The terrible chain obscene in its size, is no longer still. It grinds and shakes with the storm, and I watch in disbelief as it starts to unravel, as if something, some unknown force, is dragging it desperately, deep below the surface. Chronicler here. We here at Creepy Spaghetti would like to thank Darkly Gathers for allowing us to tell their story. If you enjoyed this story, be sure to subscribe to stay updated on these terrible tales. And make sure to check out the author in the links below. If you're interested in having your story narrated, be sure to reach out to our humble overseer as he continues his journey to pull the darkest stories from the infinite depths of the internet. Until next time, fiends. And remember, we are darkness.